Okay, hello to everyone. Uh, there was a little change in the schedule because we, we wanted to give uh, Robert 10 more minutes to present his uh, paper because he wasn't satisfied with his presentation and we would like everyone to leave the room like happy. So Robert, you have 10 minutes and uh, the floor is yours and uh, please go on with your, I mean, I will just say the title of your, presenta the, the, your, of your presentation while you share the screen, okay? Okay, yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, I, don't, I don't seem to be able to share the screen, but I ah. can just read, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a, yeah. You, you can now. Yeah, you, you can, can now. now. You have oh, the power, yeah, go. <laughs> you got the power. So Robert okay. is going to talk, like to, to make a wrap up of his presentation on deities and perspectivism in the traditional Indic knowledge practice. So, hello, Robert. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, I've been talking about sadhu culture of the Dasanami Sampradaya and the technicalities of mantra sadhana practice and its central role, and the ethnographic method of ontological participation. Uh, what occurred to me as it occurs to all in practice was that sadhana is an internalized puja, just as mantra city and internalized darshan. Both are internal and external aspects of the same relationality. In studies of South Indian Adivasi communities, uh, Nurit Bird David calls this a kind of relational epistemology, a gestural means of harmonizing metaphysical relations and suggests that it, it is the heart of what we call animism, where all things in nature are animated and alive. Anthropology's so-called ontological term comes off a, a revival of animism studies, positing anthropology as philosophy with people in it, a comparative metaphysics aimed at finding ways to take seriously the worlds of others, thinking with the metaphysics of indigenous worlds rather than, as in the colonial past, merely about them. This means engaging in forms of reflexive conceptualization, thinking grandiosely to understand different cultural worldviews as not worldviews, but worlds. This means allowing the ontological categories of ethnographic informants to influence those of the ethnographer, invariably meaning reflexively contemplating the Western materialist worldview or world and its limitations. Eduardo Viveros de Castro writes then of this kind of anthropology as a permanent decolonization of thought, a social justice of the academic social sciences where we are thinking with others instead of about them. Amazonianist Philippe Descola writes of ontological distribution, a fourfold model describing how different practices place the divisions between nature and culture, exteriority and interiority differently. In response, Viveros de Castro writes of Amazonian ontology to be the polar opposite of Western modernity. Where Western modernity sees nature as singular and culture multiple, Amazonian collectives see nature as multiple and relying on perspective with culture and conscious as consciousness and spirit singular, with shamans taking the role of interspecies interlocutors by shifting perspectives as a means of knowledge acquisition. In spending time with my informant, the Dasnami Sadhu Omgiri Maharaj, I've spent years attempting to understand how the various Indian deities could exist. For when in the practice of sadhana, one comes to know that they do indeed, if only in the psyche, exist. This question is especially pertinent not in the study of Hindu laity for whom notions of religious faith suffice, but in, in that of Dasnami sadhus, for whom what they call Advaitvad, Advaita Vedanta of Shankaracharya, posits that nothing but formless Brahman, including deities, exists. Shankaracharya states that devatas as Saguna Brahman, with attributes, exist on the level of Vyavaharika, to act in relation, whilst not existing on the level of Paramartika, absolute substance where only Nirguna Brahman, Brahman without attributes, exists. In line with this, it took many years for me to understand that for Omguri, puja and sadhana are both devotional acts and, and also reflexive psychotherapeutic projections, relational, perspectival, animistic gestures towards unseen intelligences for whom he shares an interiority. As I had written in my notes one night after sadhana in the mountains in late 2016, a deity is a perspective with a personality. For Omgiri too, a Saguna Devata is a perspective, an aspect of his self and an external intelligence with agency and character. Living an embodied life, paradoxical notions of Saguna and Nirguna, Vyavaharika and Paramatika are interior and exterior versions of the same thing. This holographic unity interplay is sung in the popular bhajan of the poet Kabir, 
Nirvai nirguna guna re gaunga. Fearlessly I sing of the attributes of that which has no attributes. Melanesianist Roy Wagner wrote of ceremonies among the Darabi in Highland New Guinea as not convention but invention, culture as constant dynamic processes of creativity and improvisation. While sadhu akaras seem entrenched in convention on display every three years at the Kummela, my own ontological participation revealed that the intended life of sannyasa is, like for Wagner, not of convention at all, but invention. This is personified for Dasnami sadhus in the ego ideal of Dattatreya, the avaduta or divine madman and guru of all gurus for whom all Indic lore is said to have originated, whose 24 gurus consisted of the elements, planets and various animals and insects in the ultimate demolishing of conventional authoritative hierarchy. Brahman and moksha as beyond national, political and religious borders, life as freedom and of heterogeneity, spontaneity and universality, things for which the oppressive chauvinistic homogenized nationalism of Hindutva, for example, are anathema. Like with, with Polanyi's segmentation of knowledge acquisition to that of the tacit and codified, all knowledge being rooted in the tacit and then codified later, the role of the pundit or conservative sadhu is to build culture as convention, Brahman as saguna and in the scriptures. The guru's role via the instruction of sadhana is to break it down to present the reality of Brahman to the student as nirguna, the perspectival engaged and embodied process of life as invention with no attributes, form or convention to follow. The journey of a sadhu through krama mukti, liberation in stages, embodied in the smarter traditions, strategic saguna worship before the surrendering to nirguna is a journey of collapsing convention into invention and in, into the ontological ground of the body. This relates to the idea of contradicting philological assumptions of scripture as the byproduct of culture and not the inverse. Scripture as merely guidebooks for samsaric log, lay people, and insignificant compared with oral tradition. The Advaitvad of Dasnamis can thus be understood as animistic relationality and ethno-psychiatric transference, like the Moroccan Sufi Hamadsha practices of Vincent Crepanzano aimed at an internalized merging with living cosmic knowledge or vidya towards the liberating understanding of unitary awareness. Viveros de Castro's demonstration of the polar contrast of Western and indigenous thinking, whether the consciousness comes from the world or the world from consciousness, reflects Samkhya ontology from which yoga emerged, where personality and body as prakriti are emanations of and subject to purusha, the nirguna attributeless source of the world as awareness with all suffering coming from falsely identifying as anything but it. As Agirhananda Bharti wrote, the entire Indian tradition is centrally concerned with showing one that one is not what one thinks one is, that one is something else entirely. On Amazonian shamanism, Viveros de Castro writes, lying between the formal subjectivity of souls and the substantial materiality of organisms is a middle axial plane that is the body, qua a bundle of effects and capacities and that is at the origin of perspectivism. We can thus conceive a deity, Brahman as Saguna, as a bundle of effects created in the nexus point between unmanifested Brahman and a manifest and subjective human body. Viveros de Castro's notion of subjecthood as an axial plane equates to Samkhya's con conception of the jiva or soul being an entangled bundle of permutations uniting Purusha and Prakriti together. Deities as instrumentalized patterns of self as Brahman in a subjective union with the body, akin to the ontological perspectives of Amerindian shamans that must must embody that they must embody and subjectify in order to know. Far from being purely philosophy, ascetic practices in India reveal complex metaphysical worlds which should not be relegated to curiosity, but like with the thought of indigenous peoples, which Western civilization has so diminished, be thought with and not merely about. Amazonian culture has upended recent discussion in anthropology around Western ontological assumptions of the division of nature and culture, just as Melanesian culture has upended assumptions about the division of self and other. Similarly, South Asian culture can help us and has to upend our assumptions about the divisions between personality and awareness. Indian thought as the source and substance of yoga is undoubtedly metaphysically wild. But as Descola and Viveros de Castro demonstrate, this has been the rule to historical cultural distribution with Western materialism, the exception. 
Among so many things, contemplating this reveals the possibility of thinking with Indian thought in a decolonial way towards social and political justice. For how we think with Indian thought goes beyond India as it goes beyond the yoga shalas and academies of the Western world. For to think with Indian thought gives us the opportunity to think with the metaphysical worlds of all non-Western cultures as with the worlds of our own cultural traditions. The critical anthropological imagination and the boldness to think about ontologies allows us to understand Ind Indic sadhanas and the yoga which emerged from it in freer ways as tacit modes of perspectival soteriological invention, modes of the body and also modes of creating and inhabiting the world. Such an imagination can also help us to think in new ways about the emergence in India of yoga as well as its journey out of India in the 19th and 20th centuries and the subsequent presence it has in our Western societies. In their recent work, The Nay Science, Indian scholars at Luri and Bhagshi critique reductive Western philology and call not just for Western scholars to take Indian thought seriously, but for the humanities in general to undergo a reshaping to accommodate the possibility that philosophy and metaphysics should have a place in the studies of culture and history. Thinking in this way and on the nature of ontological participation, our studies of Indian culture and history can be revived and begin anew. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much, Robert. Perfectly in time, on time, 10 minutes sharp. Shabash, very good job. Thanks so much. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. So I give back the words to Vicky, right? Yes, thank you, Daniel. Super. Thank you, Robert. Okay, hey, well, good evening, everyone, and um, welcome to the main part of this evening, which is the um, concluding roundtable discussion of our SOA Centre for Yoga Studies postgraduate conference, which has been running over the last two weeks. Um, thank you for joining on your Friday evening. It's noted. <laughs> it's great to have you all here. Um, my name is Vicky Adnall. I'm an MA student here at SOAS, and I'm the student rep on the Centre's committee. Um, so having been involved behind the scenes in putting the conference together i'm personally very excited to have the chance this evening over the next hour or so to host this panel conversation i think from what i can make out it's quite a rare opportunity to bring together voices new and more seasoned to talk about the field of yoga studies that we're all so passionate about uh, i'd like to start by thanking our chairs uh, dr Borin larios Professor James Mallinson, Dr. Theo Wildcroft, and Dr. Daniela Bevilacqua. Uh, they've all generously given their time and support to make this happen, so thank you. And also, in particular, to Theo for seamless, seamlessly orchestrating the event behind the scenes, which is no mean feat. Um, meeting at the Centre Committee at the start of the academic year last year, we were sort of looking ahead to a really uncertain year of zoom meetings and online events and we didn't really know what but the idea to host postgraduate conference really felt like a no-brainer and a really positive and important way to promote support and share some of the latest hot off the press research happening in the field of yoga studies and of course to the scholars doing that research uh, it can be hard for graduate students to find knowledgeable, supportive audiences with which to share their work, particularly in the early stages. And we really wanted to acknowledge that and provide a safe and supportive platform uh, for that to happen. So I'd also like to thank each one of our 11 presenters who over the last two weeks have treated us to an incredible range of ideas and discussions uh, from concepts of early samadhi to menstrual taboo. It's really been quite a journey <laughs> and not to mention some beautifully presented material. It's not easy stepping up and putting your work out there as we all know, um, particularly as an early academic, but the standard has been exceptional and has really given us a glimpse of the breadth of exciting research in the making and down the, uh, down, down the line. And that's really what we're here to chat about this evening. So uh, the format for the evening will run as follows. First, each of our chairs will give their reflections on the papers heard and any more general observations on the emerging themes in the field of yoga studies. Then on behalf of all the budding yoga studies scholars listening, like myself, we will ask our presenters how they found the whole ordeal. <laughs> Getting up and presenting a paper, what, what it was like to prepare, what they learned from the process, and of course, any advice they'd have for any, um, any of those considering postgraduate studies. 
Uh, then we'll have time to go to questions from the audience and hopefully have a more free form discussion. So, you know, over to the audience to, to uh, ask what you want of our, our chairs and our presenters. So, um, first of all, I'm just going to, as a reminder of the amazing range of topics covered over the conference, I'm going to start by reading out the names of all our presenters and the titles of their papers. So, First of all, there was Janelle Shulo, Residential Yoga Teach Trainings, Adult Learners and Yoga as Pedagogy That Transformed. Magdalena Krala, The Occult in Modern Yoga, A Case Study of the Latent Light Culture and Yogic Breath Cultivation 1905 to 35. Ruth McNeil, Upright, The Soteriology of Straightness. Erica Morton McGill, Microorganisms from a Macro Perspective reverence for the smalls in Jain yoga. Scott Lamps, early samadhi, evolution and meaning in the Nikayas, Upanishads and Mahabharata. Corinna Loire, concepts of self in Jain yoga with reference to the yoga Pradipa, a medieval Jain text on yoga. Sally Brown, do minority groups experience barriers to accessing yoga, a qualitative study in northern UK cities. For those Munda, Yoga, Politics and Possibilities for Social Justice. Robert McDougall, Deities and Perspectivism in the Traditional Indic Knowledge Practice. Lauha Halunen, Narratives of Yoga Among the Middle Class Practitioners in Bangalore, 2005 to 2006. And Bridget Boll, Who's Afraid of the Menstruating Body? Reflections on Menstrual Taboo and Yoga. So first over to our chairs. It would be wonderful to hear your response to those papers and to the conference in general, what your overall impression is of the papers you heard, if there are any insights or connections that particularly stood out to you, and if there are any overall themes that you are seeing emerging in the future study of yoga. Borian, can I go to you first? I know you're joining us from up a mountain in Switzerland. We're all very jealous and glad you can be here. So yeah, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for having me. I'm in Austria, actually, in oh, the mountains. Um, and I just, we just got here. So I'm, I'm glad that, I, that everything is working out and that I can be here with all of you today. Um, I think it was a wonderful experience for me uh, to be part of this conference in many, many ways. Um, I think the most striking point for me um, has been to, to just um, not only see and be aware of the amazing heterogeneic field that is evolving as, as yoga studies, and not just in terms of questions and research areas, but also in terms of uh, disciplinary methods. I think it's really, really valuable that, um, that as a field of study, we're also beginning to consider and engage with these developments and approaches. Um, because I, I do believe that um, this cross-pollinization can really help us to open uh, our horizons and also make us aware of you know, where the continuities and the ruptures are in the topics that we study. So I think that has been one major point for me to just uh, consider uh, all these different possibilities and emerging um, areas of, of study and I think uh, this is also precisely one point that can help us to become more aware of how these countless discourses around yoga have been evolving and which factors we need to consider when we talk and research about yoga as, as, a, uh, as a subject, right? And I think one of the fruits uh, of the evolution of yoga studies towards what we could perhaps call critical yoga studies is that we're becoming more aware um, of our own positionality and hopefully make us also more reflexive scholars uh, of the impact of our own research um, and whether we are working, uh, that's whether we're working on, on pre-modern or, or modern traditions. So I was very impressed by, by many of the, of the presentations. And while you know you are all at different stages of your research, it was really very illuminating for me to see the directions into which yoga studies as a field is evolving. And I must say that gives me hope for the future 
um, because uh, there is still so much more to be studied as, as all of your presentations show, whether it's the anthropology of different yoga communities around the world, the historical development of dominant discourses on, um, uh, on yoga in pre-modern South Asia and beyond, but also how transcultural and transnational processes have shaped what we understand as yoga today. So that's also one thing I'm, I'm taking from this, this wonderful conference. And I was also inspired by some of the presenters in particular who are also finding creative ways of incorporating, uh, say, the digital humanities or digital ethnography, ethnographic methods to work with the research questions, you know, being creative uh, during the pandemic, which has, you know, resulted in, in, in uh, constraints uh, of moving around. So using interviews on Zoom, like, Sally is doing or working with online workshops to think through and test decolonial and interventionist approaches in yoga as in uh, Frido's work. So um, I think overall, I, uh, you know, I, I must say that this was a great opportunity to, to participate in this conference and, and, and learn from all of you. So thank you uh, each and every one of you and keep up the good work. That would be my initial comment for you guys. Thanks so much, Florian. Really nice and positive. I think we all, well, certainly agree with everything you were saying there. Uh, Jim, can we go to you next? Yes, hello. Hi, good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Brilliant. Um, well, first of all, thanks so much to you, Vicky, to Theo, everyone who's helped with the organisation. It seems to have gone off extremely well. Um, yeah, I was really impressed and sort of heartened by the panel that I chaired, you know, being a uh, a pre-modernist. It's very nice to see that there's still, uh, well, I, I mean, it always has been such great enthusiasm for yoga's uh, early history. Uh, yeah, the presentations were all really sound. They made me extremely well presented, as has been commented already. I think uh, Vicky said that. Made me realize I've got to buck up my ideas with my uh, PowerPoint presentations and all of that, because they were all extremely slick. Um, what can I say about them? I mean, yeah, I, I think one, what I was heartened to see as well is the fact is, is the way that in pre-modern studies, I'm going to concentrate mostly on that, obviously, I mean, there's an amazing range of different sort of disciplinary approaches, but I'll talk specifically about my panel. Um, I was heartened to see how, you know, this understanding of yoga has got really broad. So all the papers uh, in the panel that I was chairing weren't really looking at yoga, you know, directly as people would have understood it perhaps 30, 40 years ago, if you're going to look at pre-modern yoga studies you know people have looked at Patanjali and looked for the word yoga um, but they're looking at uh, Jain traditions Corinna and uh, Erica and uh, you know and then Scott was looking at Buddhist traditions and Ruth too was looking broadly across the uh, you know all the ascetic traditions all the ascetic shramana traditions so I think that's really crucial in uh, in developing our understanding of the origins of yoga everyone was looking at really quite early periods as well I suppose Corinna's uh, brought us up to date, but that had to uh, dwell upon uh, the, the Jain tradition. So yeah, that was that was good to see. Um, I mean, I sometimes, what in terms of the discipline, yeah, I, I worry about the pre studies and sort of things that I like doing in that uh, it's very hard to get good philological training now in universities. It's getting steadily cut. Um, but there's still some pockets holding out. And this was, you know, this was promising. This was uh, made me hopeful. Um, in terms of uh, anything particularly stood out, well, I, I mean, all four papers were great, actually. Um, you know, I commented on Scott's at the time. We didn't have much time because of the four papers. I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed Corinna's, enjoyed Erica's. Because Erica's was the one, I suppose, that brought us up to date. I'd like to hear more, actually. I'm like, really uh, looking forward to seeing how her ideas about how these uh, the, the smalls, the, the Jane theories of microorganisms can you know, help us develop some sort of, how that can uh, inflect yoga practice today uh, in terms of kind of ecological understandings and so forth. But uh, one, the one that I particularly want to sort of, the one thing that really made me sit up, uh, pun intended, was uh, Ruth's, Ruth's one on, on upright and having a straight back. Because when I first read the abstract, I was quite sceptical, actually. 
and then I like, you know, what I like doing in my sort of work is now we've got these huge bodies of uh, text on our computers and I can search and I search around and actually she really had a point about how it was only the early Buddhist traditions that seem to talk about sitting up straight and it, it takes a while to get into the other traditions. So I think there's something going on there. And I'd, again, really like to see how that, that research pans out as well. Um, what was the third question, Vicky? There was a third question, was I need to be reminded of what it was. I think it was more about any um, themes you see emerging for the future study. Well, yeah, actually, so yes, on, on that score, and I, I, I'm not going to talk too long, because I know we've got lots, of, everyone wants to get a word in, but going back to what I said originally, in fact, I think it was really uh, good to see how um, how all, all four of the scholars on the panel were looking beyond, you know, yoga in the inverted, you know, yoga as as yoga. And we're looking at the kind of his, his, the, the contextual traditions that inform it, and I hope that will be, you know, a, a, a continuing theme in in historical yoga studies. So, yeah, that was great. Okay, thanks. I will wipe my tongue now and hopefully come back later. Thanks so much, Jim. Daniela, can we go to you next? Yes. Uh, I mean. Of course, Boren has already told a lot of stuff that I wanted to mention. So I will just stress the fact that, of course, I had a, a fantastic impression about the papers and the presentation and really appreciated the variety of the students and also the fact that the conference brought together students at def different levels of their academic path, of also their the research. And I think this is also useful for the, the, the people who attended the conference to see actually the process behind doing research. So the fact that there is a lot of work, there is a lot of questioning, a lot of discussing, and it's a kind of 24 hours job that is not only when you sit in front of your computer, but when you uh, talk with, uh, I mean, even attending conferences is, is a good way to get more insights. And uh, and I think this is this is interesting for those who are not, uh, you know, part of this kind of academic world, but also for our presenters, because several of them for, for several of them was the first time. And so maybe they were scared or it's, it's quite complicated. And I think and I hope they, they found a kind of uh, friendly environment to introduce and to, to break the eye that I think it's very important to be confident and to present the, the research that were like uh, several were very, very good and they were at the end of the of the path. So, of course, we have also to acknowledge this. So some people presented the, the PhD results, the thesis results. So of course, the, everything was, let's say, a bit better just because the research was going on. And I'm sure that all the others that have just started the path will do a fantastic job thanks to all the insights they could collect during, uh, during the conference. So keep studying, keep working keep thinking and sharing your ideas, because I think this is the most important thing uh, an academic, a scholar has to do. Don't be stuck on your thoughts. Don't be stuck on what you think. Just confront your ideas, especially with those who think differently from you. Otherwise, you will just, uh, you know, you will create your bubble and you will remain stuck there. Um, inside about the connection i mean it was like uh, we talk about everything in this conference from like early period till contemporary and so it was interesting as the boring said to see gathered together several disciplines several methodologies as uh, jim mentioned we had like textual sources that provide us always interesting hints to reconstruct the development, the evolution of ideas, theories, practices, and uh, and we have seen also how these kind of ideas can be adapted in new context and can be influenced by even new esoteric traditions. I mean, it's like you know we, we really talked about everything, and so it was very good food for the mind for further thinking and to even you know rethink about uh, something we had already started. 
And uh, of course, I mean, uh, I focused more on the ethnographic research and I really think that uh, yoga is, can become a, a kind of tool to investigate phenomena of transnationalism, transculturalism, and, uh, you know, to think and to engage with the social political questions and uh, with globalization, modernization, decolonization. So I think really we are at the beginning of the yoga studies. The potentiality of the yoga studies field is, is huge. And I think this conference has demonstrated that, that the path that can be developed, the topics, the subjects, is like, um, it, it's really a useful tool. We can explore the, the concept of yoga in many different paths. And um, I'm very happy to have attended this kind of new explosion going and appearing here and there. So keep working again, keep studying. I am a, a workaholic, so I will keep telling you, keep studying, keep working. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Theo and Vicky for organizing these. And thanks to all the uh, participants for making up a great presentation. Thank you. I'm done. Thanks so much, Daniela. I feel like I need to just go off and <laughs> pick up my books now. <laughs> Get on with it. <laughs> Theo, can I come to you? Um, yes, I, yes. And it, you know, I'm going to say, uh, same as Daniela did, that. Um, you know, the, it, all the things that have been said already, I, I, I also wanted to make sure uh, were said. Um, I think there's something about the interdisciplinarity of yoga studies in particular, which makes the conferences that we put on whatever stage um, uh, they, they're at um, inherently um, productive for scholars. I mean, certainly you know, the, the, the few rare times that I've that, that uh, we get to come together as yoga studies scholars, um, it's always exciting because precisely because A, the work can be quite isolating, there's not very many of us doing it, um, but B, because you are actually learning from people who are doing very, very different things often, not just in terms of what they're studying, but in terms of their methodological approaches, in terms of the interdisciplinarity of what they're doing, and this was no, no exception. Um, and uh, I think there is, it, it really shows us how much research happens as a conversation in many ways you know at best it happens as a conversation um of course i would say that as an ethnographer because most of what we do is hang out and have conversations um but you know we had ethnography but we also had you know we had the the, the, the pre-modern we had the philology we had the historical we have material culture there are so many different ways to approach this wide and diverse kind of river of experience and of practice and, and, and philosophy that that we kind of vaguely considered to be underneath this yoga umbrella um and i think that's the strength of what we do um, together and, and and i think uh the, the participants hope we've got got a flavor of that as well um within that i think there are a couple of trends i really really love and want to kind of pick out um one is the trend towards uh specificity and localization which is really i think for those of us who've been doing this a little while and you know, some of you have been doing it a lot longer than I have. Um, but still, I think what we want to see now is more specificity. That what we need to find out about is is much more depth and detail uh, to research. So I would encourage people, particularly if you're in the process of thinking about uh, uh, masters and particularly doctoral study, to rather than thinking about grand theories, to be thinking about um, small stories and how or everyday stories of where they can take you or less um well-known um uh, texts or whatever it might be you know this is a thing that we see again and again from more established scholars is that's what gets us excited now because there are so many more stories to be told um and so much more more to kind of to figure out so i think that kind of uh, specialization and localization is really important and really good um, and really honors the the diversity of of uh of you know the cultures from which uh, yoga emerges um and the other thing um forgotten yes and the other thing i was gonna say sorry adhd right i am the other thing i was gonna say is around uh, issues of positionality. I think one of the things that happens in the context of postgraduate work that I that was really strong for me, and I think is really evident from the things I'm, I'm I'm seeing, is the ways in which 
many of us come to postgraduate yoga studies because we have a personal profound contact and connection to to the subject matter in some way. Um, I know that at the first conference, the first Krakow conference uh, in 2016, I think Borian asked how many people in the room, asking a group of scholars how many people in the room would consider themselves to be practitioners. And at my rough estimate, 80% of the hands went up in that room. And I don't think that's any different to this day. So when you come at that to start doing uh, independent research either at master's or, or postgraduate or, or at doctoral level um, you really need to wrestle with your own positionality uh, within the material what's your relationship to the material and what is you know are you telling your own story or are you telling a wider story because it's that ability to tell a wider story and to tell the stories of other people that really really matters um, and saying that one of the things that interests me someone who spends a lot of time hanging around with yoga teacher trainers is how much the themes that are coming into teacher training now or into the most radical and advanced teacher training are also starting to pop up in research projects such as issues of decolonization and so on and so forth and those are going hand that development is going hand in hand um, that we're seeing those questions um being discussed um in kind of more advanced teacher trainings as well as being seeing them seeing them um, being discussed in research and that um, conversational nature between the, the research of yoga studies its impact on the practitioner and teaching community and then the impact of the teacher and practitioner community back into research is one that I think we need to be um, both excited about and careful of <laughs> as to how we manage that together um, yeah, I think those are the main things I wanted to make sure we say. That's great, thank you, Theo. And one question I have in terms of, well, being an early, uh, early year scholar is how you narrow down your, you know, it is such a vast field and there's so many roads you can go down in terms of, you know, your methodology or even the topic you focus on, like where, how do you start to narrow that down if you've got an explosion of ideas and, and thoughts in, in your mind. I, I, I can answer that first because everyone else is thinking. In my experience, you have a really good supervisory team who just keep telling you to make it smaller, 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 make it smaller. <laughs> like over and over again. But I think about the first 18 months of my PhD. Um, I don't know about anybody else. Yeah, actually, in my PhD, I wrote like a, a section um, titled The Never-Ending Fieldwork. <laughs> because the, the, the problem is yeah. that, like, even if you have finished your thesis, you will keep thinking about it. You will mm. keep collecting information. And so the problem, um, the fact is like, you will keep writing and just to put other ideas for other projects. Mm. So, yeah, this can <laughs> yeah. be... Is that yeah. any, I want to know, is that any easier with philology in that once you set on a text, do you at least have just the one text or is that the same problem, Jim? You're muted. <laughs> sorry, I've jumped on you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So I got distracted there. What was the question about whether we work just directly on well, one? When we're saying, I think um, for both Daniela and I as ethnographers, there's a real mm. problem in, in, in narrowing, like putting boundaries around your fieldwork and around your area of study at doctoral level. Mm. And I'm wondering if it's easier, is it any easier in philology because you can yeah, say, yeah, I'm just doing that yeah. one text. Much easier. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's what I always say to every, yeah, like you said, you know any having your supervisory committee what i say to everyone is you've got to narrow down your topic have something defined you know mm -hmm. even with a text i mean that said so with my phd for example when i started out working on the text i thought there were seven manuscripts but by the end of the project i'd gathered 30 so that's my <laughs> excuse for why it took six years but in those days that was allowed unfortunately it's not actually allowed anymore but um yeah, yeah, so even that, but having a, I, you really want a defined project. I was talking to two, um, two MA students yesterday, actually, about their projects, and one of them was clearly defined, and I was, you know, trying to impress upon the other one. That's really what you need to do. And in fact, it helps with the writing as well, I think. It helps with getting on with it. If you've got a set task, then you can just get on with it. If you've got some huge nebulous idea that's got no kind of core to it, then where do you even start writing? So, yeah, yeah. get the question. Um, yeah. So, but I don't know if that helps anyone who's not a textual scholar. Um, just become textual scholars, everyone. You know? 
Sanskrit, it's easy. Just pick it up and off we go. My primary supervisor is Graham Harvey and he reckons his PhD was on three words. <laughs> <laughs> that gives me hope. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be nice to hear from some of our speakers and get their view on how the experience was for them. And I know a few of them have very kindly um, volunteered to share their thoughts. So, um, Corinna, could I go? To, could I go to you and, and just to say a little bit how you found the whole experience? If you've got any advice for um, other sort of budding scholars wanting to present their work. Um, and yeah, how you found the experience. Well, good evening. Good evening from a, a very small city close to Berlin this evening. I'm very, very happy that I'm able to participate. And this is due to this online format, which really brought me into, yeah, gave me the opportunity to participate, which I would have otherwise not be, I would not have been able to make it to London, even if it was not due to the pandemic, <laughs> I fear so. Yeah, I found it a, a great idea to, to keep connected. I have been following all the uh, events by the uh, SOA Center of Yoga Studies. And I was delighted to uh, to see that so many things were now being brought online, which gave uh, gave us the opportunity to join in from virtually all over the world. So um, to, to to do this conference in this uh, online format, I think, was a great idea, and uh, it was wonderful for me to see what has been mentioned before that uh, the study of yoga is not just limited to doing text work as I have been doing it since returning from SOAS, but it's a, it's a, it's a broad range of uh, adventurous themes that you can uh, dive into. And it, it was what was great to see that there are so many interdisciplinary approaches that uh, the subject can take. And yes, I'm delighted to be a part of the gang. I, I really need to say, I feel, <laughs> I feel really great and honored to be a part of all of this. Uh, considering my own presentation, I, uh, I found it quite hard, I need to say, uh, uh, to do it in English. <laughs> I'm used to speak freely, so what I do is I, I make some notes and I then practice to go through those one those notes. And, you know, I, I had one run through my whole presentation in English and it went fairly well when I did it on my own. But it was a totally different experience to do it in front of all of you. So uh, that's something that I want to, yeah, encourage people to do. Practice uh, the... Uh, uh, the way you want to do your presentation and don't be afraid to read if you if you want to really follow you know uh, uh, you know do it do it uh, do it neatly you can just read off and don't uh, don't talk really if you don't feel like it um I would really encourage people to start early with giving presentations and if you have a chance to do so at other occasions do so because uh, it, it really is a is a great step from the first uh, presentation to the second. The first one you die completely, and the second is a lot better <laughs> because you already know that you are going to survive somehow. So it really is the experience that uh, makes you feel better and uh, it, it makes things also easier, and they, they will come more easy with uh, with uh, with the, uh, with this training and those experiences. Yeah, um, just do it. It's a it's a, it's a great thing to do, and also a wonderful way to you know stay close to people who have have the same subject but uh, have many different approaches uh, to it. And so yeah, you you will keep your your mind will keep uh, it will be open to to other ways to approach your subject, and you have a great chance to learn from your peers there. That's all basically I want to say. And if there are any questions, I would be very happy to, to answer them, especially to those people that are joining in from, yeah, from England. <laughs> so thank you again. <laughs> thank you. I think you're so right. The sort of one, one of the positives of the last sort of 18 months or so has been more opportunities to gather online because we have got an incredibly global cohort of people in the field and it, it's, you know, kind of been incredible to be able to um, bring that together on a more regular basis. So I think, yeah, that's been a real, real positive. Um, and Karina, you're part way through your PhD, I think, aren't you? So you're um, 
that's where your studies are at. But um, Scott, you, this was uh, a presentation of your MA dissertation, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And how did you find the, the experience? Was it your first time presenting? Yeah, it was my first time presenting a, a paper like this. I mean, I've, I've presented a lot of different things, but this was uh, quite nerve wracking. It reminded me of uh, when I was, you know, 13 years old or something and you get, you know, they, they say, go, and you're, my mind goes completely blank. And it's like, I'm pretty sure I prepared for this, but <laughs> there's nothing there anymore. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the, the greatest challenge in preparing, so it was a great experience. I'm, I'm very, very glad that I did it um, and got the opportunity to do it. So thank, thank you to everyone involved. Um, whittling down the topic to 15 minutes was incredibly difficult. Um, and I started, when I started, I was, you know, had the idea and it was, it was going to be twice as long as it was supposed to be. And I cut it down and I cut it down. And I still, if I had it over to do again, I would cut it down even further. Um, but it's, it was so different from the process of writing a dissertation where the, I found that when doing the dissertation, it, like, like every detail and every, uh, how would you say, like every alley or every, every possible detour is like fascinating. And you're like, ooh, maybe if I go down this alley for a little while, there is something interesting there. Um, and sometimes that pans out and sometimes not, but the, it makes like the dissertation was, was so fascinating in its breadth and in its ability to be detailed at points. And I found the, this short paper to be uh, very challenging because of the way that it, it was not that. And I don't know if that means that I should have done it differently. Maybe I should have, as Theo suggested uh, a couple of weeks ago, like pick one fascinating little detail and just dig into that, um, which is not the route that I chose to go. Um, but um, I chose to, to try to like hit some big important points and then just go like straight at them without any real uh, nuance and and I don't know if I would do it differently if I if uh, given another chance. I think I would I would probably take a different tack, and and choose a smaller portion of the topic and try to give a little bit more depth and a little bit more uh, nuance to it. Uh, I thought your paper was really clear, Scott. So <laughs> I was happy oh, with the paper. <laughs> <laughs> I learned a lot. But I think that that is a good point. That sort of editing process can be painful, but it sort of pays off, I suppose, when you've only got 15 minutes to, to play with. Yeah. Really, it's, it's really good. It, it is really good practice for being able to explain your research, particularly, I think, at PhD level, that you start out and say, what's your PhD about? You go, have you got half an hour spare? And you need to be able to explain it and you need to be able to explain it fast. It's a really good discipline to know um, what it is that you're doing uh, uh, in a really clear way and it's and it's tough it's tough every time you do it but I think the more papers you I also think the more papers you give the more you're able to go actually for this one I'm going to explore something fun that I didn't have chance to explore as part of my main research and then you can then you can use a paper as a way of doing kind of here's my fun little thing that I wanted to spend time on but I didn't have chance to um, I think so you can do either way I think I think that's the problem yeah bit like an elevator pitch, an academic elevator pitch. Yeah. <laughs> Bridget, how did you find it? Um, yeah, hi everyone. It's still Friday afternoon for me because I'm in Chicago, but um, I loved it. I'm so grateful um, that I got to participate. This is my first conference. Um, and I'm between, I just finished my MA and I'm heading into my PhD. So it was a really good kind of time to test out some ideas. And yeah, being in the States, yoga studies is not <laughs> widely known or talked about. People ask me what I do and they're like, what? Um, so it's really wonderful to kind of get together with other people that nerd out about the same stuff. Um, but yeah, I would totally second what Scott was just saying. 15 minutes is a wildly small amount of time. Um, 
but it was a great challenge. I think it's always good to think narrowly about what you're what you're talking about um because it makes it only makes things clearer uh so that was really challenging but exciting and yeah i think it's just again it's really great to be online and get to be around scholars who are like in germany and wherever um because you don't always get that uh in post in pre-covid life so As well, we'll try and create some more opportunities, definitely. Um, so I think we can go to questions from the audience now, or equally for each other, you know, uh, participant to participant, or to chair, or the floor is everybody's. So um, if there's anything anyone wants to ask, please do add your questions to the slide -o, um, or well, whilst people are doing that actually or whilst people are thinking about that there is something we do uh, need to make sure we fit in which is reminding people about the conference in Krakow next year um, so we can do a little advertisement for that um, I mean SOAS is co-hosting that even though it's uh, we're hosting it with the Jagiellonian University uh, Matilda uh, and, 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 our, and you know people in Matilda and her team and our team here at SOAS Centre of Yoga Studies we're putting it on together with help from other people in yoga studies um, the reason we're doing it is because we are just so overexcited about the possibility of being together um, like I said if, if you're not aware it's not something happening often there are you know that it's, it's normally we get kind of a corner at um the BASR or AAR or something like that to kind of hang out together or um or you know spalding or something like that so to all be together in, in one place for those that can make it is a really exciting opportunity um I uh, was lucky enough to go to the first crack up conference quite early on in my PhD and it was very formative for me and um kind of forming relationships and connections and collaborations there that that that's still you know incredibly valuable so i highly recommend for for all of our participants and anybody who's doing postgraduate study uh in yoga to in yoga studies to come to find a way to join us we're trying to make it as accessible as possible um we don't have massive amounts of kind of budget but we're a we're holding it in poland so which is necessarily cheaper to do that than it was certainly than it would be to host it in london um, so it will hopefully be cheaper to get to and, and cheaper to be at um, and we're also going to be looking into different ways of allowing and facilitating online access as well kind of like can, can we do that in, in ways that aren't um, that are sustainable for us as a team to make happen um, so it's it's ys 2021 is is, is our you can find us on all the social medias and so on. Um, the call, call for papers is out and we have until the end of October to get your abstracts in to join us. Um, and for those of us who aren't kind of academics or, uh, or you know, postgraduate students, um, we'll, we'll be doing our best to bring you what we had from that conference um, as well, because uh, I know that there'll be a lot of people who are interested in it um, outside of academia as well. But important. That's pretty much everything I think we need to say about YDYS. I haven't forgotten anything important, have I? I don't think so. I think that's a, a good advert and potentially a chance to gather face to face, which is kind of exciting. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's different. Yeah, and it's and, and the, these conversations are different when you're doing them over coffee. <laughs> I'll I'll imagine I've got a coffee in my hand. <laughs> <laughs> so. Therese has uh, her hand up. Uh -huh. Therese, can I unmute you? Would you like to ask your question? Are we having a muting problem? Oh, there we Hi. go. Hello. Hi, I'm sorry. I didn't want to raise my hand, actually. Oh. <laughs> I, I, that Mistake. I'm sorry, like, but I'm totally grateful for all of you um, presenting here and keeping me sort of up to date on the yoga study world. And it's been uh, a, like really a pleasure to to be here with you. Sorry for raising my hand. No, 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 no. Real question. No, no, no. Thank you for being here. <laughs> we have a couple of great questions coming in on the slider. 
Yeah, so I'm going to go to the first one, which is an anonymous question, which is, how do you find your experience doing the MA in Yoga Studies at SOAS? So I'm going to reach out to any of the presenters that did do their MA at SOAS. Um, so Karina, if you raise your hands, then we then we know and we can we can unmute you rather than mute, unmuting you forcibly. I think I know a couple of names, but I don't want to put anyone on this spot. So if anyone's going. To, <laughs> kind enough. Oh, Ruth Scott, thank you. How did you find the MA? I can chip in as well because I'm I'm part of the way through. <laughs> so um, I did the MA over three years, and that was due to a number of factors. But it was a complete um, eye-opening experience for me, coming from a practitioner base. I found initially it was quite a challenge because a lot of what you're taught in yoga teacher training is absolutely nothing that you learn on the MA. It's a completely different world. And I think that's really, it was a really great kind of wake up and it shifted a lot into how I teach yoga and whether I want to teach yoga. And I think, I don't want to speak for other people that have done the MA, but I think that might be quite a common experience that you come in as a wide-eyed yoga teacher and you kind of pop out the other side thinking, hmm, teaching yoga has all kinds of problems I wasn't even aware of. And that, you know, but that makes it sound kind of negative, but it really wasn't. It was just an amazing experience. And to meet fantastic people and to have the opportunities just to get deep into stuff that you don't usually get the time to be with. And, you know, I think that's what SOAS is so good at, is that you've got all those opportunities and fantastic courses to audit as well as the MA. So, yeah, I'm a bit of an MA convert, but, yeah, it was a complete, yeah, game changer for me. So, thanks. Thanks, Reed. Scott, would you agree with that? You need to unmute, Scott. I was muted, yeah. Oh, there I am. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I had such a different experience from what Ruth just explained, but I, I feel equivalent in her like awe and love of the program. Um, coming as I do from the United States, we were only able to do it in a one in one year because you can only get a visa for one year. So we had to do what is normally a two or a three year program in one year. So it was like full time, you know, like reading for 14 hours a day um, until I couldn't see straight anymore. And uh, so it was like very intense. Every term had we had three essays per term, um, just doing all of the classes, all, excuse me, all at once um, was quite intense, but um, absolutely lovely. Um, and it uh, what was the other thing that Ruth said that I, that was like very different for me. Oh, I think that if, if I were to do it again, or if I had, uh, if I could make a choice, I would probably do it in two years. Um, I don't know, Ruth, if, or anybody else, if you think, Vicki, are you doing it in three years? I am, yeah. I'm just about to go into my third. Yeah, I don't think I would recommend the one year course if you could avoid it because, like the, it was so intense, so fast. I would have loved to be able to do the secondary readings and to like let a little bit of it percolate instead of just immediately um, doing it in one year. It was like you just finished your Buddhist readings and then like okay, I. I have a couple more hours before I need to go to sleep, like immediately into history readings or immediately into perspectives readings. And it was just like this cycle of constant um, jamming things into my brain. I think the one year sounds fairly intense, but definitely I've appreciated having some time and space to think around some of the things you learn, but it has been as, you know, as we've said, completely an eye-opening experience for me and one that I'm kind of relishing. And I'm like, I'm already thinking, I don't want it to end. I've only got a year. I don't want, can it just not end? It's really, it's really enjoyable. Um, but Lucy May Constantini, who has been running our summer school over the past two weeks too. Hi, thank you, Vicky. Yeah, so I'm not sure how coherent I am after two weeks on Zoom. <laughs> Um, so I didn't do the um, traditions in uh, yoga and meditation studies MA, but I did do uh, the South Asian area studies MA, and people often thought I did the yoga traditions MA because I did a lot of the courses on it. Um, so I, I was sort of a, 
a bit of a magpie. But I, I, I completely get what Scott was saying about the intensity of doing it in a year, which is what I did. But I, um, I just want to flag up that for me, there were a lot of advantages in doing it that way. And that I came to the MA with some very clear ideas about what I wanted and what I, want, what I was doing it for and what kind of research I wanted to explore with it and also what gaps in my knowledge I wanted to fill. So um, it answered all of those for me. It was completely brilliant. And I was um, very grateful to be able to choose the range of courses I did. And for me, being able to condense it into the year was actually perfect. And I, and I, most of the people I made friends with were sort of extending, making it two years and then making it three years because they wanted access to the resources and the environment. And I completely understand that. But I also think um, it kind of depends where you are in, in your own research and your own process. So I just wanted to um, make an argument for doing it in a year if that is what suits you. And I guess that's the beauty of it, right? You can make it work around the time you have and, and, and how you prefer to work. Um, and there are some options there, basically. Um, we should probably point out whilst you're reading the next question that other, other MAs in yoga studies do exist. <laughs> and are also very good um, uh, for uh, colleagues who run those as well. Yeah, no, not meaning to sound biased. <laughs> so ask cohort here this evening. Um, I'm going to go to um, another question on PhDs. Um, so there is a tendency for some PhDs to extend to never ending projects. Um, any tips on how to keep them crisp? Um, what's the minimum time in which a SOAS yoga PhD would fructify? <laughs> I mean, Jim, Jim will say this uh, for sure, but as far as I'm aware, there are, th th this is no longer true by any means. Certainly when I was doing a PhD, there's a, there's a maximum amount of time you have to get it done. Um, the, yes, uh, the, the never-ending PhD is no longer a thing in most, most universities precisely for this reason. Um, it's, it's tight um, and uh, you have to get it done. And if you need to take a break, I, uh, you need to take a, you know, you need to take a stoppage to make that happen, as Lucy May knows. <laughs> yeah, I can say something there. Um, yeah. In the, yeah, so now, nowadays, you're absolutely right. I don't know if there's any universities where you can extend it forever. I think quite recently, someone at SOAS got kicked off their PhD program 30 years in. <laughs> but those stories don't happen anymore. And you have to, if you're on a, doing a full-time program, you have to uh, have a draft finished in three years and you have to finally submit in at the end of four years. But what you can do is go part-time, then you get double the time. So I sometimes recommend that to prospective students. That's quite a good way of doing it because, you know, three years. And the, nowadays, also the first year, you have to do quite a lot of coursework. Uh, so you don't get that much time just for thought and reflection, which is kind of key to a, to a PhD. Um, so yes, if you're going to do one, you really want to make it a defined project, but ideally your prospective supervisor will do that for you, you know, before you even, before you're accepted, a, a supervisor should make sure that your project is, is feasible uh, within that time frame. What happened, in fact, I was, I'm probably slightly guilty of it. I was one of the, the last cohort to kind of go on a bit too long. And so the funding bodies at the time were, were getting fed up. It was, mine was British Academy and they then started penalizing departments if they're, PhD students took too long so that's when the new new rules came in but yeah um, crucial thing is to have a defined project yeah I think part of what you're doing part of what hopefully is happening in a PhD is you're being one of the skills you're being taught is project management these days so it's not just an academic project is can you run a research project and running a research project is do you, you know do you know what your budget is do you know what your schedule is do you know what your time is is it is it achievable you know not not just what are you going to do but is are your plans achievable and certainly by the end of my first year I think the OU is slightly different because we don't do a lot of coursework in that first year we mostly just do the literature review and the plan and by the end of the, of the, the first full-time year so that's two years of your part-time um you had to put have put a project plan in place that said with a schedule exactly what you were going to cover and when and it had to be feasible and you had to prove it was feasible at a mini viva 
So yeah, sadly, no more the, the never ending PhD, maybe in other countries, I don't know. <laughs> Got to go in with the mission. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we'll go to the top question. Uh, to you all, what are some of your favorite yoga studies slash uh, scholarship um, slash books, sorry. If you had a recommended one book, what would it be? Daniela, can I go to you? Do you have a book that you go back to a lot or one resource or? Roots of Yoga. I think it's a kind of Bible. Yeah, I think it's like, you know, anytime you have like a, a doubt, go back to Roots of Yoga I mean, I have these two bubbles, Roots of Yoga and uh, Yoga's Body by Mark Singleton. It's like, they are my two bubbles. And then, of course, you can dig more, but the, the basic will be these two. Yeah. I have to yeah. agree on um, Roots of Yoga, particularly over, like, the first year. Like, just, <laughs> it was, like you said, it's like a Bible, like a sort of uh, holy yeah. record. <laughs> Yeah, because I think like a book is not just good because the content, but also the bibliography that suggests you. And then it opens another universe. So I think even this is important while considering a book or the other ins that gives you an... Any other top recommendations from anybody? Jim, do you have one? You're not allowed to say Richard Yeager. <laughs> <laughs> um, what can I say? Uh, what do I keep going back to? Well, I mean, it depends on the what. Do I, yeah, obviously, I have to sort of big up my teacher, Alexis Sanderson. I, whenever I'm confused about anything to do with tantra, I just look look up, you know, his his works. Um, what else? What's well, actually in terms of the historical philological approach? There's um, there's uh, Christian Bowie's work. I still that's an amazing thing that came out. I mean, it's very obscure, and not many. I, I doubt many other people will be diving into it. But it came out in 1994. as incredibly rich uh, philological work that kind of laid the groundwork for um, you know textual studies on Hatha Yoga in particular. So, I, and I, hopefully soon there should be an English translation coming out of that. I mean, yeah, of it uh, done by Jason Birch and Christelle Barawa. So that's something I often refer to. Uh, what are Veronique Bouillet's, um, what's it called? I, I, I always forget books titles, but Daniela will know, Monastic Wanderers. I look at that as well on the Nath Sampradaya. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, there's not, not really one particular book. I said Alexis Arnsby never actually wrote any books. He hasn't published any books. They're all articles. Um, yeah, that's it, I suppose. Try somewhere. Can you start a yoga studies reading group or something? <laughs> I, I, can, I can give some more tangential, tangential ones now everyone's covered the kind of yoga studies, the main, the classics, if you like, if we're allowed to say that at this point. Um, for ethnography, I would definitely uh, include uh, Ruth Bahar's The Vulnerable Observer, which is a, a beautiful book for anyone who's considering ethnographic work, I think. Um, anybody who's thinking about um, bodies and consciousness, which a few of us might be considering the nature of bodies and consciousness, I think Maxine and Cheech Johnston's work, um, if you can plough through the language, is fantastic and similarly how life moves as well which is book by oh let me see mccose um carol mccose on how life moves so they're fantastic books i think in getting us thinking about the relationship between movement um and, and consciousness um and i i'm gonna need to big up my own supervisor um graham harvey's book for anyone doing anything related to anything people might, the kind of stuff that people say isn't really religion, uh, read the book Food, Sex and Strangers by uh, Graham Harvey, um, because that's how you decide whether something's religious or not. It's whether it involves food, sex or strangers. <laughs> it's a very good argument. Very enticing title. <laughs> it's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> Borian, have you got any top tips? I know you're not next to a bookshelf, so it might be a bit harder to reel them off the people. <laughs> 
to your head. <laughs> Can't hear you at the moment. Thank you. I wasn't able to unmute myself because I got disconnected and then I, I came back. Uh, just, it was just a few minutes, but thank you for that. Um, I, I guess I have many recommendations, but um, one, um, you know, from a philological perspective, someone that I really admire a lot also for his focus and determination would be Philip Maas and his work on Patanjali Yoga Shastra. I think his work has really been uh, inspiring and, and, and groundbreaking in many ways to re-evaluate uh, um, Patanjali and, and Patanjali Yoga Shastra from the uh, someone who does like classical German philology. Um, and then uh, from another sort of more contemporary perspective, uh, someone that I also uh, draw a lot of inspiration from would be Josef Alter's work who delves a little bit more into questions of embodiment and the, uh, uh, the political in uh, particularly in India, Indian traditions, um, uh, where we don't have that much work on um, contemporary Indian traditions. Uh, so uh, from the say colonial period onwards, uh, he has done a lot of work on, um, yeah, some of the important developments that have, um, been happening there. So I just wanted to mention those two names, um, Philippe Maas and Joseph Alter as kind of two different kinds of scholarship, but I think um, they kind of reflect my own interests as well, coming from both, uh, uh, you know, being a, a, someone who did classical Indology and Sanskrit studies and someone that does more contemporary stuff nowadays. So uh, I just wanted to bring you two names. Big names as well. Hard hitters. <laughs> so we haven't got too much longer, maybe uh, sort of three, four minutes. So I'm just going to go to the um, the top questions left, which have been upvoted. So one is about resources and um, the impact of COVID with lockdowns and um, having you know access to resources. And um, I mean, as a student, I haven't had any issues accessing a lot of stuff, which has been, I mean, there's an incredible amount online now as um, eBooks and so forth. Um, but I wondered if, you know, people that are perhaps deeper into their studies, whether they've had any challenges faced um, over the last 18 months, uh, and perhaps if it's, you know, added a different flavor to the direction of your res research, I know, um, a couple of our presenters mentioned that Sally and Fadis, you know, they'd had to adapt their research methods um, to account for being online. So, yeah, does anyone have any responses to that? Maybe not. <laughs> Scott, <laughs> is that a hand for now or an old yeah, hand? Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, well, I was doing mostly philological work, so but but I ran into the same problem, which is that when you're not, when you can't go to a library, you're you're relegated completely to online. Um, that becomes a challenge. But this is where um, did Daniela just say this? Be, learning how to use bibliographies is like one of the greatest skills that that I think I developed over the course of doing a master's. And like, you know, you'll see certain titles come up over and over and over and over again. And it's like, you have to read those. Um, and learning how to use academia.edu is, it, academia is pretty good, though the search function can be challenging. And the JSTOR is also like hugely useful. And so as with so as you get access to a lot of um, scholarly journals and articles. And so JSTOR was really, really useful um, even when you didn't have access to a library. Definitely agree with that. Thanks, Scott. If I may just piggyback on that one, one, one thing that I found really useful as a student um, was to overcome my, my fear of reaching out to the scholars that are actually working on the things that, I, that are relevant for me. Uh, and in my experience, as it turns out, most of the scholars are actually really friendly and approachable in our field. 
So if you think that they might have an answer or work, they're working on a text on, or you've seen on the bibliography, but you don't have uh, access to the publication, just try to find out the email of the person and just drop him a line and you might be surprised. They might be even more helpful than you could ever think. So just reach out to the scholars that you admire. I think I wouldn't have um, been able to write my dissertation if I didn't have the help from the uh, scholarly community out there. And, you know, most folks are really uh, helpful and willing to support students. So just reach out. I love that tip. It's a friendly bunch in the yoga, uh, yoga studies field. <laughs> Bridget. Unmute. Um, yeah, no, I will second reaching out to people. I think that's one of the biggest resources that we have and I have found that I've never really found a scholar who doesn't want to talk about their work so um I think most people are pretty excited to share their work that way um I also found half a trust is really useful halfytrust.org they have like all of these amazing resources um previously like unscannable pdfs are now like totally searchable uh, which has been really helpful. So I just wanted to throw that out. Great tip. I haven't heard of that, so I'm gonna go and check it out in a minute. Um, Lucy May, Constantine. Hi, um, so uh, I'll try and be brief and just a, um, a slightly less kind of, well, it's, it's not really not positive. It's just a statement of fact that if you're, well, in my experiences, I'm studying something that's regionally very, very particular. Um, so it's, it's very localized to a particular place and there's virtually nothing online about it. So the resources I need to access historically are in libraries that I haven't been able to access. And um, it also involves uh, an embodied practice that you, there's no way of doing it digitally. You have to be in the space and you have to be with the people. So um, at that point, I think there's a choice to be made. Do you do a completely different kind of research which, as Jim was saying, you now have to be really specific when you apply to do your PhD. So actually to completely redesign it becomes really quite challenging. And maybe that's not what you want to do. So I decided that and I've just kind of called quits on it until I can do those things again. So I think there's choices to be made. Is it a project that you can viably change and you're happy to do? Or is it something that really, in order to, to kind of sanely do the research, you just have to wait until the situation allows it again? Well, it must be frustrating to be on hold. Can I ask what your, your research is on? Sure, I'm looking at the relationship between practice and manuscript traditions in the South Indian martial art, Galeri Payadda, which is uh, a, a regional variation based in Malabar in Kerala. Amazing. That's the elevator pitch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you get to start that research again soon. Thank you, Vicky. Uh, okay, I'm going to go for a final question because I know I'm holding you all on your Friday night. But this one's been upvoted a couple of times, so um, I'm going to get it out there. What are some good places to publish independent research around various nuances of yoga? in not such an academic setting, but that has meaningful impact nonetheless. Any of our chairs in particular have a thought on that or, um, or any of our presenters? I think it's a really difficult one. I think it really depends on what, what it is, you, what kind of research you're doing, what, what kind of outputs you've got. Um, uh, if you're, you know, when you're talking about nuances of yoga, are you talking about um, guides for practitioners? Are you talking about sociological analysis? Are you talking about something more textual? Um, and there are different places, different uh, that may or may not be appropriate at that point. And um, anywhere you publish, generally speaking, uh, you're going to be publishing in, within a particular publishing ecology, right? So if you publish within an academic ecology, then there are certain ways, certain standards that you're expected to hit as a result. And it's not that those are the only ways to find truth, but if you want to publish in an academic peer-reviewed journal, for example, you have to go through the peer-reviewed process and you have to, you know, you have 
you have to jump through certain hoops to do that. The same is true if you want to publish journalism. You know, if you want to pitch an article to, um, to you know, one of the, the to an online newspaper or magazine, then there are journalistic standards to adhere to. If you know, so it's going to really depend uh, on on not just uh, on the one hand on what you want to publish, what's your audience, and and what what's the nature of what you're trying to produce um, and what's the therefore what's the right ecology for it if that makes sense Ruth can I come to you can you put your hand up hi hi I just had a couple of if, if it's definitely non-academic academic so not peer-reviewed then there's Tarka and also the luminescent Jacqueline and Jason's um forum but yeah just some suggestions uh, brilliant Thank you. Um, I'm really conscious of time, so I think we're going to have to wrap up for this evening, even though um, there's, there's a few more questions there. But it, this has been, I don't know, really valuable for, for me as a student anyway, and I hope it has for everyone else as well. Um, so, yeah, I guess thank you to all our chairs again. Thank you even more so to all our speakers for putting their, their work out there and taking the time to be part of the event. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to um, Theo for some final comments. Um, I don't know, is this our last Centre of Yoga Studies event? I was, yes, we, so, yes, I was just thinking the same thing. I know we've suddenly got to that point. I am, it's the last thing of the year. Um, uh, it's been such a busy couple of weeks. I think that's come on a bit quick. Um, <laughs> But yeah, this is our last kind of live event of, of this academic year. Oh, there are still kind of recordings to go up. Um, if any of our presenters or any other um, postgraduate researchers or students want to write any blogs for us, do get in touch. I uh, will do that as well. I personally am going to take a lot of time off over the summer. That's mostly what I'm doing. I've got lots of leave to take and do that. We have a we have plans in place already uh, for some fantastic speakers coming in the autumn. And, uh, and uh, later into 2022. Um, we're just beginning to think about maybe what an in-person event might look like again, although, you know, who knows in the UK, um, they do tend to change the rules on this on quite a regular basis. Um, so, we might, you know, we, 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 our aim is to continue to doing most, most of our events online and then have a few events in person, kind of special events, as much as anything, so we can all kind of hang out together. Um, so yeah, lots to come, but a breathe and a break and a pause um, uh, uh, before we do that. Um, yeah, I think that's everything. Apart from, unless anyone else has anything to add. No, I part from you start thinking about your abstracts for next year's postgraduate. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> and for crack off. Put them in now, put them in now, um, because we want to make that as big and as exciting as possible. Um, so yeah, get your abstracts in for crack off.